uh, I always think uh, good poetry is always both nourishing and disturbing at the same time. Uh, and uh, it's always breaking us open into real conversations. Uh, and I always think real conversations undo us as much as they, uh, they do things to us. Uh, and the undoing is to get back to some kind of uh, clarity, radical undoing, uh, some space, some silence. Uh, it all happens in silence, spaciousness, where you're not naming things. Uh, that's where you actually come across the part of you that's equal to what you're involved with. I want to uh, read this piece. Um, <clears throat> in this uh, cycle of Irish poems, there's a whole series around the loss of my mother and, uh, and the uh, sudden uh, experience I had of, uh, of a lack of foundation in my life after my mother had passed away. And the sudden understanding that you thought you were out in the world uh, having this Indiana Jones-like experience and all the time your mother had been there as a, as a foundation to your life, yeah. And I had uh, very powerful experiences, actually, of my mother when I was out in, in various places and uh, with my life at risk, of my mother actually safeguarding me in very strange ways. But then I'd dismiss it afterwards, yeah. But it's only when you lose someone really close in your life that you realize they're actually a, a part of the fiber of your being. Yeah. And when they've gone, when their representation has gone in the physical world, you have to uh, fully welcome them into your body in a different way. And uh, so one of, the, one of the experiences you have when you've lost someone is that you keep just hearing their voice uh, out at the edge of uh, your consciousness. Yeah? or the phone rings and you think, oh, it's, and then you, a microsecond later you realize uh, it can't be them. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and then you're also curious about where they are. You're curious about why they left, for a start. They often say, why did you <laughs> just decide to go? Why didn't you stay around longer? And, uh, and then human beings have always had this ancient dynamic of of uh, greeting their lost uh, loved one through uh, the auspices of the natural world, you know, through a rainbow, the end of the valley, a sudden feeling as if it was sent specifically for them, or a bird tapping at the window in the morning, the auguries, you know, the, the sense that we need some kind of news to understand where they are and what they're about. <clears throat> And uh, with my mother, I had this very disturbing sense that actually my mother was on to much bigger and greater things now. <laughs> <And> <laughs> didn't want to be so concerned with, with uh, perhaps with the family life that she'd had now, you know. And uh, my mother was a very loving mother, actually. But so it was all the more disturbing for the firstborn son of an Irish mother to suddenly realize that you weren't number one priority in, in the universe anymore. And that mother might be on to other things, you know. Uh, so it was really a curious, uh, curious sense. And I had this sense that my mother was in a new childhood in a strange way. Yeah. My mother lost her childhood when she was 13, when her, her own mother died, actually. And uh, my mother had to be uh, a mother to her sisters and brothers, actually. And then the family was broken apart by the bad old Catholic Church in Ireland, and, um, uh, which led to a lot, of, a lot of heartbreak. And my mother and her sister fled to England, actually, so that they didn't end up in some awful place where the church wanted to place them in a laundry or something. So, um, um, so there's a ref reference to my, to my uh, mother's mother in this piece. But I was, at my, I was at the cottage in Yorkshire uh, where my uh, mother and father lived and uh, my mother had passed away. And, uh, and I kept having these dreams of seeing my mother and then I'd be just about to talk to her and she'd turn away and I 
she'd be gone, you know. And I was just about to hear the news. Uh, so I had another one of these recurring dreams. My father was in the house at the same time, I was at the other end of the cottage, and, and uh, I dreamt that uh, I was sat on my mother's bench by her rose tree. She had these Dublin Bay roses, is the name of the roses. They give red roses all summer, marvelous. I have them at the house on Whidbey Island now, actually. And uh, I dreamt I was sat on that bench where my mother used to sit by her roses, and I got a letter, and it was a letter from my mother. And in the dream, as you know in a dream, I knew that in the letter was everything I wanted to know about my mother and where she was. And when I looked at it, the sunlight was falling on it in the dream, and I was so happy to get this. I was, I was, I was joyous, you know, having received this letter. And I was, so of course, in the dream, I was just about to open it when I woke up. Um, <laughs> and uh, I did what we all do, you know, I tried to put my head back on the pillow and fall asleep and get back into the dream. And, and then I sat up, you know, and with reference to that, uh, that core of us that I was addressing earlier that already knows, already understands, or is already fully equal to both the loss and the moving on and the full pattern of what has occurred. I sat up and I said, David, you know what your mother would say in that letter. Part of you knows what your mother would say, so go to the kitchen table now and write your mother's letter to you. And uh, so I went in, the fire was out, and, and uh, my father was still asleep. It was a cold winter's morning, but I, I wrote this piece, farewell letter. She wrote me a letter after her death, and I remember a kind of happy light falling on the envelope as I sat by the rose tree on our old bench at the back door, so surprised by its arrival, wondering what she would say, looking up before I could open it and laughing to myself in silent expectation. She wrote me a letter after her death, and I remember a kind of happy light falling on the envelope as I sat by the rose tree on our old bench at the back door, so surprised by its arrival, wondering what she would say, looking up before I could open it, and laughing to myself in silent expectation. Dear son, dear son, it is time for me to leave you. I'm afraid that the words you are used to hearing are no longer mine to give. They're gone and mingled back in the world where it is no longer in my power to be their first original author nor their last loving bearer. You can hear motherly words of affection now only from your own mouth and only when you speak them to those who stand motherless before you. You can hear motherly words of affection now only from your own mouth and only when you speak them to those who stand motherless before you. As for me, I must forsake adulthood and be bound gladly to a new childhood. You must understand this apprenticeship demands of me an elemental innocence from everything I ever held in my hands. I know your generous soul is well able to let me go. You will in the end be happy to know my God was true. And I find myself after loving you all for so long in the wide infinite mercy of being mothered myself. P.S. All of your intuitions were true.